It all started kind of innocently enough. I just wanted a nice cup of coffee. Uh, I found that the shops I'd go to, sometimes it'd be good and sometimes it'd be bad, and that really frustrated me. Um, I remember one day, a barista really, like, he looked like he was ready to throw something at me because I said I'd, I'd pay again for the same cup if he just made it better. So then I decided oh, I'll just do it myself. So I went to a farmer's market and I'd buy some coffee and I'd bring it home and I'd grind it and I'd brew it and I'd taste it and it'd be wonderful. And then the next week I'd go back to the same farmer's market and buy the same coffee from the same guy and I'd bring it home and I'd brew it exactly the same way and it would taste awful. I just started to like Google how to make good coffee. There's a really scary world out there online of like internet forums and coffee blogs and I just got really really interested in coffee and I started to buy coffee online. I then started to, like group buys with people on the internet. We'd all come together and buy coffee together to save on the shipping costs and then we'd like meet up in dark alleys and <laughs> in supermarkets and swap coffee bags. I remember my wife coming home from work one day and she walked into the sitting room and I was there tasting all these coffees with about 12 guys and she was like who are they and I was like oh I met them on the internet. At the time I was working in investment funds and I had a really good job. The people were really great that I worked with. They all enjoyed it, but for me it just, it wasn't what I wanted to do. It's, like I had to sit down with my parents and say, okay, you know this really great job that I've worked really hard to get and with the education that you paid really good money for and all the support you've ever given me. Well, I'm gonna jack that all in and I'm gonna go make coffee. And like, I think they were worried, but I suppose they'd be more worried if I didn't tell them, if they just came into a coffee shop one day and saw me standing there with a hairnet. And then when I got a job as a barista, I decided that I, I'd enter the Irish Barista Championships. The, I didn't think I'd do very well at the Barista Championships, I was just doing it to learn. They'd give me this like prize for best uh, espresso, I think it was, or best cappuccino, and I was kind of happy with that, I was delighted. And a lot of mistakes had happened in my routine, so I kind of thought, oh, this is just a consolation prize. Uh, and I was kind of admiring my trophy and they called out my name. I just remember just being like, what is going on? The problem then was that I was now going to the World Championships. And that was on in Atlanta in 2009. The year before, the Irish competitor had won, so everybody was like, who's the next Irish competitor? And I had six months experience. Like, I was the weak link, so I needed an incredible coffee. I made a list of the top kind of 10, 15 roasteries that I knew of. At the time, I'd been buying coffee from Steve Layton, who runs Has Been. It's a roastery in the UK. Just, just by chance, I emailed him first. And like within four minutes, he sent me back an email, like this long. I don't know how he types that much. Uh, saying like, OK, I want you to come over this Saturday. I'll meet you at the airport. I'll bring you to the roastery. I'll show you the coffee set. And I got all this sort of stuff. And I was like, wow, that's pretty impressive. Like that list that I wrote of all the roasters, I, I never got back to the list. It never got any further than Steve. Pretty much motivated by the fact that I didn't want to make a fool of myself. I just uh, went hell for leather and I got my uncle to build a training room in my apartment that was the exact size and spec of a competition stage. And I bought uh, a competition spec Nuova Simonelli Aurelia, which is the only one in the country at the time. And then what I'd do is I'd just lock myself away in the room and just practice my routine over and over and over again, talking to judges that weren't actually there. Okay, so I've walked onto stages in front of like like 5,000 people and had MCs scream out for everybody to throw their hands together and cheer loud for Colin's cappuccinos and then this like call go insane and you're like it's a cup of coffee with some milk in it like it's you really have to like step back sometimes and go this is absolutely bonkers it was a year to the day that I started in coffee that I, I was competing in the finals so I finished fourth in the world which is like again it was a massive shock to me but it was all down to just blocking everything out, just focusing completely on coffee for that year. I wanted to open a shop then in Dublin. It's kind of my focus after the first competition. What I wanted to do was to focus entirely on the coffee. And like at the time, the coffee culture in Dublin was one that was like, like a friend of mine says there, was, there wasn't really a coffee culture, there was a panini culture, you know what I mean? And it was, everything was like, 24 ounce mocha chocolates with sprinkles and vanilla syrups and everybody was using Robustas and everybody was using like mystery blends and kind of nobody was focusing on fresh roasted coffee and it, was, it just wasn't very good. So I wanted to do something that was kind of used excellent coffee and like just very simple, very clean and just, you know, 
focusing entirely on, on, on very, very small lots of coffee and making them taste as good as possible. So I was kind of stuck in that sense. And then I met Trevor O'Shea from Body Tonic. And then he told me about a, a nightclub that they had in the city centre on Abbey Street called the Twisted Pepper. He said, look, just take the space. If you start to make money, you can start to pay rent. If you don't, what have you lost? So it wasn't the kind of most polished or ideal of scenarios, but it was a start. So 5th of December 2009, I opened 3FE in the lobby of a nightclub on Abbey Street. 3FE stands for third floor espresso, and it's kind of, it's, the name comes from the third floor apartment that I had. Two guys called Connor and David, who have a, a graphic design company called Connor and David. And they um, sat down with me and I talked to what I wanted to do with the shop. They came up with this logo and it's like, 3FE stands for third floor espresso. And it's interesting because one of the problems I was saying is that like it really annoyed me on, on, in coffee shops when you see the logo of a coffee shop or the name. And then the cups always, the paper cups that sit upside down in the cup are on top of the machine. And you'd be like, what does it say? So they kind of came up with this thing that was like, <laughs> it, uh, it works both ways. So yeah, it's funny. I get like an email a week from somebody saying, who designed your logo? <laughs> the idea from the start, and it still is like the mantra, I suppose, is that you make a nice coffee, be nice to people, and they'll come back, guaranteed. And that was what the brief was. And it was like, it took a long time. There were bad days. Like I remember one day in particular, this the group of six lads came into the shop uh, and it was just me and the coffee machine and they were wearing suits and kind of had you know, their hair all done all this and kind of they, they looked like what I looked like a year before that you know they obviously worked in finance or something and one of them was kind of smiled and he said uh, what coffee have you got today and I said oh I have one from whatever uh, San Jose and he said oh uh, what's that like so I started talking about the coffee and the six of them then just start pissing themselves laughing and walked out the door and he'd come in just to take the piss out of me. Uh, and they just thought that this was hilarious. And I shut the door and I got really upset. And I was like, kind of, that's it, I'm jacking it in. I'm, I'm not doing this, this is ridiculous. And then there was a knock on the, on the shutter and I wasn't going to answer it. And I kept knocking. So I pulled the shutter up and there was a guy there and he was like, are you open? And I'd recognised him from the day before. And I was like, uh, yeah, I was, just, I was just in the bathroom, yeah, yeah. And he's like, I just brought my friends down. So I was like, all right, so I opened the shutter. And him and his mates came in and they sat down and they had like four or five coffees each and they all bought like two or three bags of coffee. And it was like the biggest sale I'd made in like four weeks or whatever. And I remember like just thinking afterwards, like I was like, oh, well, look, there's people like that that exist and they're out there. And uh, I don't know, I just kept going, but like, I don't know. I look back on that and I kind of think if he hadn't knocked on the window, if I would have opened the next day, you know? I always wanted to have my own premises. And like, in fairness, the guys at Body Tonic knew that. Um, I just wasn't able to afford it. So then it's, it was, uh, September 2011, we opened on Grand Canal Street and uh, we had our own place. I had two customers at the time from the Twisted Pepper. Uh, Key and Anaki, and they were, uh, they'd like just left college and they were starting up a, uh, a design company called Design Goat. And they, like, they're just out of college, like, nobody's gonna really take a risk on them. Um, so I called them and I was like, I've got a coffee shop and I have a vague idea of what I want it to look like. And I gave them, like, a very small brief. I said, it needs to do this and it can look whatever way you want it to look and I just gave them free reign on the place. It's nice because I see like a lot of their problems in, in what I was faced with when I started. Like, and who's gonna take a risk on you? Um, I'd like to think we've done that with a lot of people as well because all it takes is one person to recognize that you actually give a shit about what you do. Again, it started quite slowly and it just kind of built it up over the time and then um, now the place is, is flying it's seven days a week and I mean, it's, it's always full, it's great, we really love it. So at this stage, there's about uh, 18 people that work at 3FE, but at the last count, ever expanding. And I think being in Dublin, there's a pretty unique opportunity to tap into a young, enthusiastic, creative and hardworking uh, set of people that I think the city itself can be very proud of and that I'm really lucky to have here.
Oh yeah, if I talk too much, just let me know. I, I just, I think that I'm nervous. I keep going and going. Well, in Dublin, uh, I think I've been lucky to see a big change since the very first day I was here until now. It's changed a lot. Most of the time, you start talking a lot. So people will come in and will look at the menu. They will put this uh, surprise face a bit lost sometimes, and you will explain around what you have. Uh, the different coffees you are brewing this day, how, try to find out how they would like to drink it or how they drink it usually. You might not realise it and most of you might realise it, but when you walk into a cafe or a restaurant or a bar for the first time, the person serving you knows it's your first time. They can tell. Yeah, like when we see somebody come in, it's their first time, it's just, we try to focus on them and make them feel comfortable because that's what it's about, that's why you go to coffee shops, you come in, you have a coffee, sit down, relax, that's why we're there. Well, once we had the new shop um, up and running and everything was going well there, uh, thoughts quickly turned to establishing a coffee roastery here in Dublin. So we actually stepped away from the shop at the Twisted Pepper, uh, and that just allowed us, kind of gave us the, the headspace to look at uh, building the roastery. So we found a place down the docks. It was actually four years to the day that we opened at the Twisted Pepper that we started roasting in the docks. One is getting to know your coffee. You need like you, you get to know it inside out. You got you got to be as consistent as possible. Like every single roast has to be exactly the same. We have some serious customers these days, and they they know they they know what they're drinking. They know what they're tasting, and, and there's, a, there's a little bit of pressure to kind of nail everything. Pretty much for the whole time you're roasting, you're you're pretty much watching, listening, smelling everything. You gotta know, you gotta know what you're doing. So like, I think you'd have to call it a craft. I, I used to be a chef and like, you always prized the, the most amazing ingredients and the most seasonal ingredients. And you know, what we have here is, is exactly that. Like it is the best coffee in the world. And like the green coffee we receive is, is as seasonal as you get. There's people out there who call themselves foodies who should really get excited about this. I could give you like an excellent bottle of whiskey and then you go home and put down four glasses and you can pour four excellent glasses of whiskey and drink it and it will be excellent. And it's the same with like wine and I suppose cheese to a certain extent and those sort of things. But like I could sell you a really expensive, amazing bag of coffee and you could make it taste absolutely terrible very, very easily. And there's that gap in between like buying great coffee and drinking great coffee. We also run courses pretty much every weekend. So we have uh, two different courses. One is focused in coffee and home brewers, pretty much how you can make a filter coffee and lots of tasting. And you know, you show them how different a coffee can taste, whatever, how it's been processed, uh, where it comes from. A lot of the wholesale uh, side of the business is training. Um, we don't really like to just sell people coffee and then let them get on with it. It's, it's a really big part of it for us that we kind of help people to, to get the best out of the coffee that they're buying. So yeah, we spend a lot of time doing tastings, uh, trainings, whether they're practical or theory. And uh, yeah, that's generally where the, the most fun parts of the job come out. Everybody always says that they had no idea that there was so much to it. It, it nearly becomes a curse. We go to with wholesale customers, it's really interesting because they come on board and they're like, oh yeah, we want to learn how to make great coffee. And they start off with this kind of elation of, yeah, the coffee's going to be great. And then it kind of gets better and better. And then after about three weeks, they just hit this like huge like depression of like, this is awful, this is terrible, everything's going wrong. And like, we can kind of see it coming and we kind of like talk them through it. The ignorance is bliss and you're training them to spot problems. And all of a sudden they're seeing problems everywhere where they never saw problems before. And then they think that what they're doing is awful. And you're not like, you're actually doing much better than you were before. It's just that now when something goes wrong, you can see it, whereas before you didn't care. I think right now we're focused on uh, not opening any more shops, but just helping people that want to open coffee shops. Uh, so we're taking on more wholesale customers in Dublin, uh, all across the country. And um, then we'll continue to kind of grow online sales. And just, I don't know, at this stage, I don't want any more shops for 
free of fee, I just want to make our one better. I think out of everything, I'm probably most proud of the fact that when I come to work every day that I enjoy what I do. That's essentially what I set out to do at the start. Yes, the coffee's good, but it wouldn't be worth it if I didn't enjoy what I did and the people that work with me didn't enjoy it, so that makes me pretty proud. Thank you.